Thank you all so much for being here. It's really lovely to have faces in this room again. Um, it's been a long but steady journey back toward in-person events, uh, so thank you for being a part of that. Um, welcome to B Brookline Booksmith's Author Event Series. My name is Bonnie Adderstrom, uh, and I'm the Assistant Events Director here at Brookline Booksmith. On behalf of all of us here at the store, thank you so much for being here. We are grateful to be back in person and appreciate you choosing to spend your Tuesday evening with us. Because of your support, we can continue to celebrate the important work of authors like Bo. Um, I do have just a few housekeeping items to mention before we get started. Please remember to keep your phones on silent for the duration of the event. Uh, this event is being recorded. I'm sure you saw the C-SPAN camera back there. Um, we also do have a live stream over on this iPad here. The audience is not visible on the iPad, um, but if you don't want to be live on YouTube, try not to walk in front of it. Um, if you pre-ordered a book or would like to purchase a copy or five, uh, those are available at that counter in the back there. Bo will be signing at the end of the night. Um, and lastly, there is a Q&A at the end of the event, um, so get those burning questions ready in your head. Now. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the most recognized figures in the global deba debate community, Bo So. His new book, Good Arguments, How Debate Teaches Us to Listen and Be Heard, tells the inspiring story of his life in competitive debating and reveals the timeless secrets of effective communication and persuasion. The book begins with Bo's family moving to Australia from Korea when he was eight years old. He writes about his struggles as a young immigrant trying to fit into a school setting that alienated non-English speakers and the unlikely activity that helped him to find his voice. Debate. Jamaica Kincaid called Good Arguments a book so timely and needed in this fractioning world we are living in. But was a two-time world champion debater and a former coach of the Australian national debating team and the Harvard College Debating Union. He's written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, CNN, and many other publications. He's worked as a national reporter for the Australian Financial Review and has been a regular panelist on the primetime Australian debate program, The Drum. We are lucky to welcome him to the Boston area as he is currently a Juris Doctor candidate at Harvard Law School. Everyone, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bo So. Thanks very much. And good evening. Um, this feels to me like a kind of a homecoming. Um, some of my closest friends in the world are in the audience um, as our family members um, and the camera crew from C-SPAN, uh, the cable satellite public affairs network. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here with you. Good Arguments is a book about my education, and so I want to acknowledge the presence of mentors and booksellers and colleagues, friends, my aunt who came from Seattle and my mom who came from Australia. Each of you play many roles in my life, but it's in your capacity as teachers that I want to acknowledge you and to thank you and to thank you for being here tonight. I would like this to be a kind of a conversation, but I recognize that I owe many of you an explanation of what I've been doing these past uh, several years as I wrote this book. So I'll talk a little bit about what led me to write this book, I'll talk about what's in the book, and I'll talk about what I think about it now that there's been some distance since I finished the book and uh, since I've started talking quite intensively about it and then I'll take your questions uh, and comments. So the story starts in the third grade when as an eight year old, I moved from South Korea to Australia where I grew up. And I very quickly learned that the hardest part of crossing language lines is adjusting to real life conversation, much more so than reading or even writing. And the reason for that for any of you who've gone through that experience is live conversation has so many interruptions and about faces and jagged rhythms and all of those 
difficulties tend to compound when it's a disagreement because the passions tend to run, people's facial expressions don't really match what's coming out of their mouths, and there's a kind of a tension in the air that keeps you from expressing yourself as clearly as you might even otherwise. And so going through that experience on the playground and in classrooms and all the other places where I grew up, it didn't take long for me to tire of the effort and the pain and the self-disclosure that such arguments entailed. And I resolved at a point not to disagree at all, but to wear a soft smile, to nod along, and to keep my thoughts to myself. Things changed for me in the fifth grade when I joined the debate team. And this was an unusual choice that I made of the strength of a single promise. And that was the promise that in debate, when one person speaks, nobody else does. And to someone who was used to being interrupted or spoken over or just spun out of conversation, that seemed to me the promise that I had been waiting for. And when I stood there in the amphitheater for my first debate in elementary school, with all the eyes on me, I saw the crowd as a kind of, I saw in the crowd a certain kind of a peace. And it wasn't the blankness of, or the hardness of a wall, but it was the stillness of a river. It was something, it was a kind of stillness that I could do something with. And at that moment, I became hooked on this activity to which I've given most of my life so far. And what I learned along that journey was that debate had a bunch of other rules in addition to when the speaker speaks, nobody else does. That there was turn taking, just the way that when I had a go, you would get one too and I would get a chance to respond. That everybody who's involved in a debate would get equal time in which to speak, that there would be a set topic um, to which we had agreed to direct our remarks to focus on for the duration of our time together. And those rules, which were simple enough for children to learn and to internalize and to practice, formed a kind of an acoustics against which good conversations and arguments could unfold. They couldn't always guarantee that the conversation wouldn't be hostile or that it, it wouldn't lead to conflict but it gave us a better chance than anything I had encountered to allow such conversations to unfold. I learned soon after that debate also gave us a bunch of strategies and advice and hacks to be able to navigate those rules, to be able to compete and ultimately to win at them. And that wisdom, which traces back all the way to, to rhetorical education in ancient Greece, to similar traditions in the East and Talmudic traditions, that all of that kind of wisdom had been given the sharpest, most practical application in debate uh, because generations of speakers like me had learned to compete and to argue within this, within this tradition. I found as I went along that journey that the disadvantages that I felt or the sense of marginality that led me to pursue that activity in the first instance was a source of strength. That in having to listen before you speak, in having to read a room before you made a contribution, you learn that in order for a message to kind of carry across, it has to be a two-way conversation between listener and speaker. But as with anything where the lessons are deep and weighty and difficult to understand, it's the kind of thing that you had to be taught multiple times. And the first passage that I thought I'd read to you came when I was in the 12th grade after I'd been competing for about seven years, competing at my first world championships where I met some of the friends in the audience today uh, at this competition. And it's in the lead up to the World Championships for High School in Antalya, Turkey, 
And my coach, who was this kind of big, burly, Australian, brilliant guy, um, had told us to call bull something a little bit more um, when it came to responding to our opponents. And this bit of advice um, induced in me a, a flashback, and, and this is where I'll read from. For most of my life, I had been terrified of conflict. Behind the brutalist main building of my elementary school in Seoul had been an unpaved patch of dark orange dirt. There, away from adult eyes, the older kids learned with their fists the uneven weight of bodies. The scuffles lasted a few minutes. Two kids circled each other, mustering the courage, then broke orbit to the animal noise of a cheering crowd. In the pivotal moments that ensued, strength never failed the losers. What broke first was the will. I watched this unfold in the first grade and learned that proximity to violence elicited in me a gastric response. The acid soured my guts, then rose to the back of my throat. Though one could safely watch these fights as a member of a crowd, I felt in my bones the thinness of the line between spectator and participant. So I stayed at the other end of the school, the side with the gardens and parking spots, and kept my uniform bleach white. Over the next decade, I developed this gut instinct into a full-fledged ethic, a theory of how one should move in the world. In my everyday life, I tried to dodge, ignore, hide from altercations. I made an art form of non-answers and deflective jokes. The reward of assiduous avoidance was likability. Whereas friends lost days of their lives to petty fights, I relished the comforts of getting along. This view of conflict aversion as a life hack had a long history. Under the guises of propriety, complaisance, agreeableness, and good manners, it appeared everywhere from ancient Egyptian papyrus scrolls, quote, silence is how you establish your superiority over him, to how to win friends and influence people. Quote, there is only one way under high heaven to get the best of an argument, and that is to avoid it. The wisdom of such advice seemed to me self-evident in the 21st century. If one feature of our public life was the absence of reasoned arguments, another was growing rancor and enmity between political opponents. In this era of furious politics and culture wars, conflict seemed to me not not only a prudent life choice, but also a virtue. Turning the other cheek, scripture said, was neither stupidity nor weakness, it was wisdom. The mood around the table was tense. In most training sessions, Bruce gave instructions and we wrote them down. As in, an elite, as in an elite kitchen, we asked for clarification, not justification. But this time was different. Calling bullshit seemed to be at odds with everything we had been taught about treating our opponents with respect. It smacked of the dark side of the force. Bruce looked around the table. He adjusted his glasses, scratched at his beard. I'm not asking you to do this just to get ahead, he said. Right now, you're defaulting to agreement without really listening to the other side's arguments. You're deferring to the opposition without giving them the more basic courtesy of hearing them out. I glanced down at my notepad. The column for our opponent's arguments was sparse. A handful of words and short phrases scattered its length in a random constellation. I had understood that the default to agreement was not an ideal strategy. However, I was learning that it could also amount to a kind of self-deception. The pretense and the other person's argument was too strong when, in fact, their rank and stature had overwhelmed us. Besides, you don't actually agree with the opposition on any of these points, do you? Bruce said his voice slowly rising. No, you're just holding your tongue. That's cowardice. The same as saying, "Mm mm-hmm, interesting, and hiding what you actually think. Direct rebuttal isn't just something we do for ourselves. It's one of your basic obligations as debaters. You owe your opponents a proper response to their arguments, 
and with it a chance to improve. You owe, you owe it to the audience to present the other side of the story. The more Bruce spoke, the more I recognized in his advice a strain of optimism. Rebuttal was a vote of confidence not only in ourselves, but in our opponents. One that contained the judgment that the other person was deserving of our candor and that they would receive it with grace. Calling bull entailed faith in our ability to make something positive out of disagreement. By contrast, conflict aversion seemed to be premised on a much darker set of assumptions. It held that disagreements were bound to be ineffectual, if not divisive and outright destructive. It was a view that could have arisen only from an even dimmer judgment about people, that we could not be trusted to do right by one another. I was not sure which of the two perspectives was correct, but as Bruce brought our last training session to an end, I felt I had arrived at a good question. Could rebuttal be more than a destructive force in a disagreement? So I was so possessed by that question and the joy of all the discoveries that I was making as I trained in, in, in kind of the way of an elite athlete, except nothing like that. Um, <laughs> as I tried to climb the ranks of, of competitive debate. I followed it all the way here um, to Harvard College where I competed for the team and many of my teammates are here. And I traveled all around the world with my debate partner, Fanella, who's sitting in the last row, as is his want, um, uh, to try and really master um, this art that I had, had made mine. and in. January 2016, we won the World Championships for the university uh, competitors under the tutelage in part of our coach Alex and, and some other seniors on the team. If the book stopped there, it would read as a kind of a triumphalist sports type memoir of all the different matches that we had lost in, but then ultimately prevailed in. But of course, in 2016, this country went through one of the most divisive presidential election cycles that it had seen, electing President Donald Trump, whose rise was fueled at least in part by his performance in the debates. The year after that, I undertook a master's program that was designed to be a kind of a bridge between China and the United States, between the West and China, and I studied for a year in Beijing. And I saw the kind of the optimism with which we begin with which we began the year and the program sink into some of the most uh, fraught periods that that relationship had seen in recent years as the trade war between the two countries began. The following year, I went home and I was a newspaper reporter and I covered an election that mirrored many of the most divisive and toxic elements um, of the political cycle that we had seen in the United States in 2016. And it seemed to me through those events that a truth began to crystallize about our time, which was that we are living in a highly polarized age, that polarization and internal division within countries and between countries was going to be maybe the defining challenge of our time. And in that, in the beginning of those days, it was hard to see that disagreement and conflict could be anything other than a source of weakness and of potential conflict both within and between countries. What followed was a large number of books giving detailed explanations of how it is that we came to this point, historical reminders that democracies could in fact die, uh, and talking in broad strokes about 
the structural problems that had produced the moment that we were living in. It was at that time that I, as a kind of a reporter, joining the ranks of a profession, trying to understand what kind of time we were living through, but also hungry for some kind of answers on what we could do about it, not just at the level of the institutions or the structures in which we were living, but as in our day-to-day -day lives as citizens, that I started thinking back to my days as a competitive debater and especially my childhood as someone who got started in this activity. And the conclusion that I came to was that in this period of great loss, in this period of the loss of shared values, the loss of shared truths, that we had also lost a common set of skills for how we engage with one another in disagreement. The skill of argument. And that was the kind of impetus for writing this book. And what came out was both a kind of a toolkit and a testament. And this book offers readers both a kind of the basic lessons that's required to master this activity that they might not be familiar with, but it also makes a case that it is possible to build a community around and not despite disagreement and offers the world of competitive debating as a kind of an example that shows some of the limitations to be sure, but also some of the strengths and possibilities that can be gotten when we face disagreement and we engage with it rather than avoiding it. So the book is organized in two parts. The first half steps through what I consider to be the basic elements of debate, which are topic, argument, rebuttal, rhetoric, and the choice to engage in disagreement or not. And then in the second half, I apply that to different areas of life, whether that be dealing with bullies and, and people who argue in bad faith, in education, in relationships, familial and romantic. Uh, and I think a lot about in the last chapter, how we disagree online and the role that technology can play in that. Throughout, there are different strains. Um, there's one strain that's a kind of a memoir that walks through my journey with this activity. There are pedagogical moments where I'm teaching some lessons or skills that come out of the debating um, world. And there are more essayistic reflections on the time that we're living in and some of the themes that I've spoken about um, so far. The more I wrote and the more I thought about it, the more I saw life in debate and I saw debate in life. And in the second excerpt that I'll read, um, it's a set of reflections on uh, a kind of a important political moment in Australia in 2018 when we had a kind of a national plebiscite um, for uh, whether to allow same-sex marriage or not. And this was about a discussion that uh, took place in the church where I was raised um, in the aftermath of that vote, um, which thankfully was in favor of same-sex marriage. So I'll read here from the uh, chapter on relationships. It begins with uh, a kind of a church-wide meeting, the first of two that was called um, to discuss this issue. People started, people started filing into the main hall around 2 p.m. They carried over facial expressions from whatever they had been doing before. Some were smiling, others were working things out. Parents told the children to go play for a while. The pastor, a quiet man with the work ethic of a farmer, was already seated. He opened the meeting with a prayer for wisdom. In the beginning, the conversation was stilted. Senior members of the community outlined the facts of this difficult situation. 
The mood in the room was not unpleasant, but was draining in the manner of treading water. That the hour would pass without a single interesting development, rendering this a failed but harmless experiment seemed entirely possible. Then, an older woman near the front of the room raised her hand. She was a quiet and conscientious member of the community, one whose faith had been cultivated through periods of undisclosed suffering. By this time, most people had let their minds wander far enough to miss this subtle gesture and its intimation of purpose. Scripture is clear on this point, she said. Why are we even discussing this question? Her voice wavered. The words themselves were audible, but the meaning of the sentence was ambiguous, suspended between a joke, an indictment, and a plea. Yet as she continued, she seemed to discover a new resolve. The intention, once formed, ran through the rest of her speech like an iron rod. It steadied each syllable and imparted to them a trace of metal. The purpose of a church is to uphold the faith. That means saying yes to what is right and no to what is wrong. If we bend to fashions, we lose our integrity. For a while, the room was quiet. The speaker slumped back in her chair and seemed suddenly fragile. Those who had been waiting for their turn hesitated. A young parent, a young parent slipped out of the door to check on a child. Then something broke. The next few speeches were flecked with unreasonable anger and an earnestness that teetered on the brink of tears. Time between contributions shrank. Time between ideas shrank. Time between words shrank. And soon the room was a buzz on every register of sound. The arguments raised were various and they did not always intersect. Even moments of genuine contact released their own kinds of poison. In response to one person's argument that opposition to same-sex marriage would confirm public perceptions about the church as an outdated institution, another said, that's ridiculous nonsense. But what was ridiculous? The conclusion or the reasoning or the area of concern or the person raising the point? All of the above or none of them. Such ambiguity left to linger could spoil the air. The discussion at church wound down after more than an hour to an unedifying close. No decision had been reached, but that could wait. There would be another session at the same time next week. The minister, who had been quiet throughout the discussion, ended the meeting with a prayer and a request. Thank you for your contributions this afternoon. I ask that you go home and think about your fellow congregants. Try before we meet again to think about things from their perspective. His instruction reminded me of a technique from competitive debate called side switch. Much of debate was an exercise in certainty. The moment one received a motion, one adopted the mindset of a person who was completely convinced of that point of view. One clung to this feeling of absolute conviction to make arguments, sink objections, display passion. But there was also a window between the end of prep and the start of a round when one let in the uncertainty. Side switch. In the last five minutes before the start of a debate, do one or more of the following. One, take out a new piece of paper. Imagine that you are now on the other side of the motion. Brainstorm the four best arguments in support of the position. Two, review your arguments from the perspective of an opponent. Think up the strongest possible objections to each claim and write them in the margins. Three, imagine that you have won the debate from the opposing side. Write out the reasons why you won, including the mistakes made by the opposition. Next steps varied. One could revise an argument to answer possible objections or plan rebuttal against opposing arguments. One could strategize to block the other side's paths to victory. But the basic idea was the same. Set aside the certainty of one's convictions and see things from another point of view, all in order to improve one's chances of winning the debate. From this switch position, a uh, side switch gave us a first-hand experience of the subjective, exper 
of the subjective reasonableness of other beliefs. For a time, we felt what it was like to believe ideas that contradicted our own. We traced the steps of how a sensible person, us, could arrive at conclusions that might otherwise have seemed alien. From this switch position, we also saw ourselves in another light. We entertained the possibility that we might be the ones in error, that our beliefs were the results of certain choices and assumptions and not others, that we might be the ones who had to be tolerated, accommodated, or stopped, that opposition to us was natural and expected. Together, these aspects of sites which pointed to a certain way of thinking about empathy. Whereas most people viewed that term as referring to a spontaneous psychic connection or a reflection of virtue, debaters knew it as an understanding achieved through a series of actions. This vision of empathy was unexciting. It called not for goodness or imagination, only paper and pen. But the upside was that it gave us something to do when our other faculties, imagination, virtue, emotion, intuition, had failed. It asked us to get to work precisely when we were stuck. So that's all the book is um, and, uh, and I, I finished the first draft of it about a year ago, or I handed in my manuscript about a year ago, and I thought I was done. Um, and it turns out that that is the beginning um, and not the end of the process. And so uh, I've now had a chance to step away from it a little bit. Um, but I'm having to talk about it, you know, every day. And when you're writing a book, it encompasses the four corners of your world, right? You're in this Google Doc and uh, you don't know where land is and you're just kind of swimming around in these ideas. Um, but once you're done, you see that actually it takes up quite a modest amount of space in the world. Um, it's not that big. <laughs> it's sort of see it in the back. And, um, and, and the ideas themselves, though important, um, occupy only a, a piece of the puzzle. I think an important piece, and uh, I don't want to talk it down, but uh, only a piece of the puzzle. And what I've been thinking about as I've kind of toured this book and, and thought about it is two things that I thought I'd, I'd close with today as a way of um, inviting your thoughts and, and beginning the discussion. And these are sort of two puzzles or concerns that I have that I'm still working through the answers on. The first is that debate as a dyad has two faces and that some of the things that make it in my mind a worthwhile activity, something worthy of our attention, are the same features that open it up for abuse and exploitation. So an activity that celebrates spectacle opens itself up to fakery. An argument that relishes disagreement can provide openings for aggression. That a sport predicated on open-mindedness can open itself to lies and to abuse. And I think this is a puzzle that doesn't have any obvious answers because it's not that you can excise and clearly excise the bad aspects of debate, put it away, and just keep the good parts because each of those features has a kind of a doubleness. And I think the best we can do is to kind of manage it, um, but I don't think it's a problem that goes away. The second thing is, you know, when you're publishing a book and you think about where on the wall it's gonna fit, uh, you sort of think um, it's making a, a contribution to a certain question. And this is most straightforwardly, of course, a book about debate, um, but it's an answer to the broader question 
which is how should we disagree, which itself is only one sliver of a broader question, which is what do we do about the fact that each of us are different, but that we must coexist, that we're not different just along relatively straightforward lines like racial or sexual or, or sexual orientation type divisions, but that each of us in the fullness of who we are are quite different from everybody else, but that we have to share this space and this time together. Disagreement is one answer to that question, and I'm suggesting in this book that it's something that we should be more attentive to, but it's only one answer to that question. And that broader inquiry of how it is that we can live in the fullness of our dis differences and still get along, a question that feels as urgent to me now as it did when I first encountered it as an eight-year-old and an, and an immigrant to a new place. Um, I hope to spend the rest of my life trying to answer that question. And I'm really, pl I'm really pleased to share with you tonight uh, an early and first attempt um, at making a contribution to that. So thanks very much for coming, and um, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, so the, uh, just for the microphone at the back, there will be a store microphone and a boom microphone. Um, so you're going to be very audible. Um, so questions or comments? Hello, Bo. Hi. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Can you take this off? Um, you should identify as the author of an upcoming book on wine. Uh, yeah, I, I feel you on the journey mapping over. Um, <laughs> but this is about you. And I'm really excited to read your book. I was curious, you said you finished it about a year ago. You turned it in, which probably was six months, five months after January 6th in the U.S. Capitol. And I was curious if you discuss or examine in your book anything about conspiracy theories or misinformation and the sort of strategies to hold space with people whose truth is fundamentally not true. Yeah. 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 So of course the, the problem of misinformation and and, and group organization of the kind that you're describing has lots of different overlapping sources and, and not all of them are going to be addressed by the kinds of things that I'm advocating for in this book. But where I do think it connects is what is it about the state of our populace that we can be kind of vulnerable to the sort of the twisting of the truth, of demagogic speech, right? And one answer to that, an incomplete answer, but I think a part of it is the kind of the atrophying of the skills that I've been describing, of a population that cannot distinguish between good arguments and bad ones, of rigorously supported ones and not rigorously supported ones that doesn't trust itself to engage with the opposing perspective, I think that's a population that's especially vulnerable, that lacks a certain kind of immunity um, to the sort of bad faith actors and, sort, and the sorts of abuse that you're talking about. So um, And I hope it's not just COVID that's making me think along these terms. But, but, you know, you want to think about why is civic health important? A part of it is immunity, I think, um, to what might otherwise uh, 
be contagions of thought and, and practice that would otherwise spread. Hi, Bo. Hey, Julie. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, what kind of rethinking have you been doing through both debating or writing this book? Um, and the premise is sort of, I think, debate is one of the best forms to cross-examine our prior beliefs. And I was wondering if there are certain motions or cases or just current events that you have examined and re-examined and revised your stances on. Yeah. And Joy, you're a debater. You know all about that. Um, you know, one thing is, uh, you know, debaters often complain of not being able to form strong convictions because the nature of our sport is you're given a random topic and a position and told to go. And over the course of your career, you've basically argued both sides of everything. Right? And so there's a kind of a mercenary quality potentially to that. And the sense that you're kind of always in this primordial zone of, of you could go either way um, kind of thing. And I used to see that as a real limitation of debate. Um, Joy and I used to make the same complaint. But nowadays, I think it it's not so much that debate is antithetical to strong conviction, but that it does call for a different understanding of that term, which is conviction is not something always that we bring into a discussion that we guard zealously, but rather it can be something that we take out on the other side. Now, of course, the belief that we come out of on the other side is going to be a bit more nuanced and textured but I think it's a mistake to think that extremity of the position is the only marker of the strength with which you can believe in it. That the kinds of ideas that debaters tend to have, which is this doubleness, right? And, and it's kind of typical that in like the one book that has ever, ever been published about celebrating debate, I can't stop thinking about its limitations, that that doesn't mean um, I don't believe in it all the same and that the strength of my belief is lesser for that. So um, that's something I've been rethinking, what conviction means and, and, and how it connects to the kinds of conversations that I'm advocating. Hey, Bo. Hi. Point of information. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the question I have coming from India, yeah. um, multilinguistic country, is how do you engage with the role of language and particularly rhetoric in the context of debate, um, particularly when you know you have people of different languages in the same country and and actions or other non verbal forms of building community and engagement might be easier or more effective than trying to cross those linguistic divides. What do you think? Good question, why I didn't write a book on the topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a challenge. But it is, there is also an opportunity in it, right? And what I see in, and you know, there are probably some universals, right, that underlie different cultural understandings of rhetoric, but there's a lot that's different. And I saw that when I was involved in the debate community, even here, versus in Australia and certainly China is very different. And the reason why I think it might be a possibility not knowing very much about the particular context you're talking about, Trevor, is when you have people with two quite different ideas of what good rhetoric is, 
and they converse, it's usually the case that there, there's some kind of a third that emerges, right? And that there is a lot of borrowing that happens. And so um, what begins as kind of a clash between fairly unitary things tend over time to generate something new. Um, and rhetoric, perhaps more so than almost anything else, requires careful management, right? Because there are those possibilities for abuse. But that kind of cross-cultural translation and evolution, um, I think, can be to a country's great strength. Um, hi, Bo. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I am a lot more torn about like the value of competitive debate yeah. in achieving some of the outcomes that you discussed mm -hmm. for many reasons, but one that I think sort of rides off what you said about conviction is that I actually think the opposite thing about conviction, and this is my experience, I never debated at the levels you did, but this is my experience in terms of what I think competitive debate fostered in me and what I've seen in my friends who competitively debated as well, yeah. and I actually think, in my experience, competitive debate sort of structurally incentivizes people to not express uncertainty in conversations. Not express certainty? Yeah. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or a feeling of, I don't know what the answer to this question is. Yeah. Or, um, and I think part of that comes from a feeling that you need to win a conversation, um, which, and I feel like sometimes a more collaborative approach in conversations yeah. can be very useful. Yeah. Um, where you sort of like piggyback off what the other person said, take the best of what they said, sort of build on each other and recognize that neither of you really knows. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of thinking more adversarially, which I think debating sometimes incentivizes, can sort of get in the way of that type of vulnerability, which I think can grow friendships yeah. and um, sort of build consensus that's personal, that's deep, and like all of the ways I would want to foster conversation. So I thought I'd love to get some of your yeah, thoughts on that. I love that. I love that. Um, the very particular way in which debate is adversarial is it's like a contest, right? And it's also a game. Um, and it's a game with rules that has winners and losers in the way that um, the kinds of conversations that we have day to day maybe shouldn't. And the thing that I would say is, um, and I don't use that word game in a pejorative sense at all, right? We use games to learn things all the time. But the thing about a game is that it sometimes has to end, right? And so um, part of what I'm suggesting in the book is debate as a game, as a sport, has all of these lessons that I think are positively transferable in it, into our day-to-day -day conversations. But it's a problem when all you have is the game and the sport of it, right? And, and I think a part of it um, is, I guess you practiced it in your own life, which is knowing when to stop being a debater. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and I guess I make that calculation um, within individual conversations too, of when do I think debate is no longer the right set of tools and I have to reach for negotiation or mediation or collaboration or some of those ideas that you described. So um, I think there's something to be investigated further about games and our approach to them that might um, help us kind of make more progress on that. Question at the back and also at the front. Um, I'd like to hear oh. your, your observation <clears throat> on the next presidential election. The Republican National Committee has said they will not engage in any debates with the Democrats. Yeah. So, with the press, I think that's a bad thing. Yeah, but but there's an alternative. The, the Republicans in their primary are going to choose a candidate, and he's not going to formally face to face debate of either Biden or whoever's or, or whoever replaces Biden. But the press will force a debate, not a formal debate on a stage, but on a one-to-one -one basis for each candidate. 
one to one against one another. No, no, no. The press will. L let's say J John Doe is the is the candidate for the Republicans. Yeah. And so CNN and Fox are going to interview this individual. Oh, I see. To get his or her's point of view. Got it. And the, the Democratic candidate. Got it. So the debate will not be on a face-to-face -face basis. Got it. It'll be kind of ad hoc. Got it. Got it. I think I would favor the face-to-face. -face no, but it's not going to happen. Option. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, um, and there is you know, a kind of a limitation to the way in which a lot of these political debates happen at present, uh, which is they do devolve into dueling press conferences or, um, or uh, almost a kind of a brawl, really, where it becomes about a show of dominance rather than an actual debate. And so, you know, and, and I think you might know more empirically about what kind of formats they're considering than I do. But my hope is not only that we arrange a debate, but that we have a society in which our leaders, but also we do as citizens, have a clearer understanding of what engaging in an actual debate looks like and develop the skills to be able to do that. And that within the round and the encounter, when there's always the desire or the temptation to turn it into something other than a debate, to make it a shouting match or name calling or something like that, that we be able to resist that and to remind one another that it's a debate that we're having and not something else. Question there. Hi, Bo. Hi. Uh, I think one of the more striking uh, images for me from the readings was that moment when you were. Uh, uh, behind the school and keeping your shirt white while other kids uh, were choosing to fight. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, the line that you tried to draw through, you know, teaching your reader about about argument, but through narrative nonfiction, and how much of your your personal story you wanted to include uh, in your book and, and your thought process as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they should, they should, you know, parents should tell their children not to write memoirs when they're, when they're in their, still in their 20s. Um, and I didn't at the beginning, right? And I thought this would be a kind of a, an essayistic, uh, maybe a manual, you know, it was that for a period of time. Um, but I don't read manuals. <laughs> you know, and uh, and there is also a kind of, and I was thinking the more humble thing would be to do a kind of a, an impersonal, you know, here's what I know. But now having written it this way, I think like whenever I read just a nonfiction book, I think, well, how do you know that? You know, where are you coming from? Right? Because you're you, you were somewhere when you wrote it, you grew up somewhere. Um, and you saw things from this height um, and in this location. And there are going to be limits to that. There are going to be perspectives that are added from that. So it came about because I thought I had known quite a bit about debate by the time I started writing. I thought most readers would know very little about debate because it's a kind of an insular, funny little community. and. That bridge I found really hard to, that distance I found hard to bridge. And no matter how well I tried to write, how clearly I tried to write, I couldn't really do it. Um, and may, a better writer could have, maybe, but I couldn't. And so I thought, actually, I know someone who knows very little about debate and then learn, and that was me. And I thought, if I can take readers from a position where we're kind of evenly matched on how much we know about this activity, and we work our way up together, that would be the way to do it. Um, and so that's why it reads the way it does. We have time for one more. Okay. Sorry, Mike. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I have not 
read your book yet, but I look forward to it. Um, the idea that debate with a big D yeah. um, would have lessons for mere mortals like me who don't do it, um, but do a lot of debate with a little d, yes. it, it's very attractive. Um, but to ask some very practical questions. Of course. Um, my world is Israel-Palestine. Okay. So when we are discussing or debating, whether it be on social media, by email, in real life, on Zoom, or whatever, um, folks are not listening to one another. Yeah. They are not interested in the logic or the holes of each other's debate. They're not even generally responding to the content of what someone else is saying. Um, it goes very quickly to a personal attack, an accusation, um, uh, distractions, um, all kinds of non-debate stuff because yeah. folks have not agreed to these rules that yes. are the scaffolding or the container that you say is so valuable. Yeah. So what can we who actually need to learn how to resolve problems across these very profound lines of difference uh, that are not just about ideas but about identity and it, it feels existential yeah, to people absolutely. Um, how do we do that yeah I liked um, I liked how you said it in the question actually which is that you've not agreed to these rules right and I think and and those are rules about how we have the conversation isn't it right and so in the world of as you say big D debate every disagreement begins with a kind of agreement which is we're going to sort out our differences this way and not a different way. And maybe importantly for the particular issue you're talking about, we agree we're, we're not going to tackle the whole issue in one go. We're just going to talk about this question that we can meaningfully make progress on within this limited amount of time that we have. And so um, when you were talking about the different channels and media across which these disagreements happen, each one has different acoustics of the sort that I was describing earlier. Each one has different rules. And some of those rules might be more amenable to the kinds of conversations that we want to have as opposed to others, right? Here I'm thinking about social media versus face-to-face -face, um, discussions with some of the rules that I've been discussing. So I would you know, think about and I think this is something we need to do as a society, think about that element of agreement that comes before the disagreement, which is agreeing to a common set of rules and a common set of um, practices that we're gonna abide by in order for the conversation to go well. And it may be that we're not always able to get such agreement because of some of the reasons that you talked about, but the thing that gives me some measure of optimism is that this shouting across one another works for very few people, in my, in my estimation. That many people are exasperated by it, that they're, tired of, that they're tired because of it, and that there is some room for experimentation and people looking to do things a different way. So that's kind of what I'm banking on, really, um, and I hope it's true. All right. Thanks so much. I'll stay around. I'll find books and I'll take any further questions. Thank you.